Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15427 in the name of Gail Ross on equally safe at work. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Gail Ross to open the debate. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to open this evening's debate on the Equally Safe at Work accredita accreditation scheme. I'm particularly pleased to see so many members attending on the day that marks the official launch of the scheme. And I would like to thank those that signed the motion and those that intend to speak in the debate. I would also like to welcome Ruth and Kelsey from Close the Gap to the Visitor Gallery and thank them for hosting a drop-in for MSPs in the Parliament today. Scotland's Equally Safe strategy is a fantastic example of the partnership working between the Scottish Government and COSLA in association with a right, wide range of partners from the public and third sector. This partnership recognises the importance of working together to tackle and ultimately eradicate violence against women and girls. First published in 2014, the Equally Safe strategy was revised in 2016 and in November 2017, the Equally Safe Delivery Plan was launched to promote collaboration. In November 2018, a report was produced to measure the significant activity and progress made on the delivery plan. As part of this overall strategy, the Equally Safe at Work accreditation programme was formally launched earlier today by Close the Gap. It aims to address the causes of the gender pay gap and to better support employees that have experienced gender-based violence. Close the Gap are Scotland's expert policy and advocacy organisation working on women's labour market participation. As part of their work to support the Equally Safe strategy, Close the Gap reviewed international practice and found no existing employer accreditation programme with a focus on violence against women, gender inequality and the workplace. Presiding officer, poverty in Scotland is gendered. The gender pay gap is the difference between men and women's hourly pay and can be caused by a range of factors, including lack of flexible working opportunities, perceptions of gender appropriate jobs and grading structures. Women's inequality at work is a key contributor to women's higher rates of poverty. They are twice as dependent on social security than men and therefore have been disproportionately affected by welfare reform. Women's economic inequality reduces their financial dependence, restricts their choices in employment and in life and can create an environment that can make violence against women more likely. This world leading programme is pioneering by making this link and focusing on the employer's role in preventing violence against women. The pilot programme provides employers with a framework to support their own work, along with a detailed handbook to provide evidence-based advice and best practice to those participating in the scheme. For too long, violence against women, domestic violence and gender inequality have been seen by some employers as issues for others to deal with and that somehow such things don't need to be tackled in the workplace. This programme seeks to change these attitudes by providing the support and guidance to ensure employers are in a position to support the implementation of the equally safe strategy. It is critical that employers recognise their role in tackling inequality and gender violence. Having taken the decision to establish the accreditation scheme, Scotland's councils were asked to express an interest in participating in a pilot programme. And I was satisfied to hear that all 32 of our councils responded positively. A clear demonstration of the commitment from local government of their ambition to eradicate violence against women. Initially, councils were asked to complete a self-assessment of their own existing equality measures and from this, seven were selected for the pilot scheme. This recognises the different stages the councils are at and to also ensure a geogra geographical spread across the country. The Highland Council, Aberdeen City, Midlothian, North Lanarkshire, Perth and Kinross, Shetland and South Lanarkshire councils will, over the course of 2019, work towards achieving accreditation by taking the necessary steps to address the cause of their gender pay gaps and to better support employees who have experienced gender-based violence. 
Alongside the pilot group, a shadow group has also been established, including those councils who had completed a self-assessment but were not selected for the pilot scheme. And this group will hopefully be amongst the next phase of the accreditation scheme. Having been selected, each pilot council will, from February, undertake an employee survey. This exercise will be repeated towards the end of the pilot year in order to measure the change in attitudes and awareness and to demonstrate an improved understanding of gender violence and their role as employers. President Officer, I'm sure that people are wondering why do we need an accreditation scheme? More than three million women in the UK experience violence each year with many more living with experiences of abuse. This abuse will affect all aspects of a woman's life and the workplace is no exception. In many ways, employers are uniquely placed and better able to support women to find the help they need and to stay in work. Sometimes perpetrators of domestic abuse and stalking often use workplace resources such as phone and email to threaten, harass or abuse. And these tactics, such as sabotage, stalking and harassment at work, affect women's productivity, absenteeism and job retention. Sexual harassment in the workplace is now a high-profile issue and there is increasing pressure for employers to take action. Women report sexual harassment as having a negative impact on their mental health and it can cause some women to avoid certain work situations in order to avoid the perpetrator. All of these effects and responses are also likely to diminish their performance, confidence and likelihood to apply for promoted posts. In the Highland Council area alone, 2,336 incidents of domestic abuse were recorded by the police in the year 2017-18. And these are, the only cases that we, these are only the cases that have been reported and we know that there will be many others that are never reported. Our local councils are the largest employers and this places them in a unique position to make a real change to attitudes. So the launch of the Equally Safe at Work accreditation scheme yet again places Scotland at the forefront of actions to tackle violence against women and girls. I very much look forward to hearing the outcomes from the pilot programme at the end of the year and seeing the first councils being awarded their accreditations. And I thank the Minister in advance of her closing statement because I know that this is a subject that she has worked on very closely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ross. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms. Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank Gail Ross for bringing this important debate to the Chamber? It's one that I think is important to all of us as we strive to make equality and protection for women and girls absolutely mandatory. Can I also thank Close the Gap for their uh, comprehensive briefing. As Gail Ross explained, Equally Safe at Work is a world-leading employer accreditation programme being piloted in seven councils throughout 2019, uh, the councils outlined by Gail Ross. The programme has been developed by Close the Gap and supports the implementation of Equally Safe Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls. The strategy recognises that violence against women and girl, women is a cause and consequence of gender inequality. As co-convener of the cross-party group um, of violence against women and children, the, the reality of gender violence is shocking. This programme focuses on, a, on women in the workplace, which is a fundamental step in addressing gender-based violence more generally in society. Presiding officer, um, as Gail Ross outlined with her statistics, violence against women is perpetrated at epidemic levels. Three million women each year in the UK experience violence and many more live with past experiences of abuse. It's a violation of women's human rights and it's an enduring social problem that really should not exist uh, in 2019. It affects all aspects of women's lives and the workplace is no exception. So it's vital that employers understand the impact of gender-based violence on women so that they can support women better at work and uh, can help them access the support services that they need. The economic cost of violence against women in the UK is estimated to be £40 billion and this includes the cost to public services and the lost economic output of affected women. Domestic abuse is estimated to cost the UK 16 billion, which includes an estimated 1.9 billion uh, loss due to decreased productivity, uh, administrative difficulties and, uh, from unplanned time off and lost wages, etc. But for me, it's about much more than money. It's about the degradation of women and the abuse of their human rights to be treated with respect. 
One in five women in Scotland experience domestic abuse in their lifetime and three quarters of women are targeted at work. Presiding officer, that's shocking. Per perpetrators of domestic abuse and stalking often use workplace resources such as phones and emails to threaten and harass and um, abuse their, their current or former partners um, or, or even strangers. And studies have shown that the emerging practice of co-working or hot desking leaves women with no protection against predators. And this is something that must be addressed urgently with clear guidelines applying to those using and those renting the workspace. Research on experiences of sexual harassment at work is likely to be affected by underreporting because most women don't report it because of a fear of being blamed and, and possibly a lack of confidence in the complaints procedure. But as Gail Ross said, women report sexual harassment as having a, huge neg a hugely negative impact on their mental health, making them less confident at work um, and, and inducing them to, to avoid um, certain situations so that they don't um, come into uh, contact with the perpetrator. And this severely affects women's chances for progression at work um, and, and the, the gender, the gender uh, pay ca gap is exacerbated by this, not to mention their own financial uh, situation and, and uh, confidence. So Equally Safe at Work will support councils to develop an increased capacity for addressing these inequalities and better support female employees who've experienced gender-based violence. And as Gail says, it provides employers with a framework that provides evidence based advice, guidance and best practice. Presiding officer, I believe this is a good initiative and will play a vital part in protecting women in the workplace. I also hope it can be rolled out to as many workplaces as possible um, so that they can learn from good practice because women must be protected in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you. And can I gently remind members to use full names when referring to colleagues in the chamber. Chatty though this is and friendly debate though it is. Um, I now call Annie Wells to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thanks to Gail Ross for bringing this extremely important topic to the Chamber today. Last November, I participated in, the, in a debate on ending violence against women and girls. <clears throat> During that debate, we acknowledged the importance of tackling sexual harassment and assault in the workplace, an issue that has garnered a lot of attention due to the Me Too and the Time's Up campaigns. Too many women in this country remain subject to sexual harassment and assault in their everyday employment. And following the widespread sharing of stories in the wake of the Weinstein scandal, we began to understand it, the extent of the problem. A poll showed that half of British women and a fifth of men had been sexually harassed at work or a place of study. And of these people, 63% and 79% of the victims, respectively, kept it to themselves. In the wake of this, it's encouraging to see pressure for change. In the Scottish Parliament, we've seen the running of the Culture of Respect workshops open to all staff, including MSPs. Out with this place, I'm encouraged to see the setting up of the new employer accreditation programme pilot, and I thank Close the Gap for its efforts in developing it. I will be very interested to hear how the pilot develops over the course of the year and how best practices can be encouraged in the private as well as the public sector. At the very least, it could be clear in every work at the very least it could be clear in every workplace in Scotland who employees can make their complaints to and how they will be handled. And it should also be clear what constitutes sexual harassment at work. And despite the impact of the Me Too and the Times Up campaigns, I feel there's still a lot of confusion around what exactly it is, something that needs to be clarified in the mind of the public going forward and I would be interested to look into this further. Employers absolutely have a vital role to play in advancing gender equality and creating a safe environment for women. As Close the Gap points out, not only will this involve preventing violence against women at work, it will involve employers considering women's different experience, experiences in all aspects of the workplace. Women are concentrated in undervalued, low-paid jobs such as admin and cleaning, and they are vastly underrepresented when it comes to management and senior positions. And by creating greater economic equality between men and women and increasing women's choices in employment, the risk factors to a woman's resilience being diminished in the workplace can be reduced. And that is hugely, a hugely important topic in itself and one that unfortunately we don't have time to debate today. 
What I will say, however, is that at present, women are estimated to earn £70,000 less over their lifetime than men because of the gender pay gap, and that this labour inequality costs the Scottish economy £17 billion a year. These figures are stark, and it's time we had a frank discussion on bold measures surrounding childcare, flexible working, and inspiring young women through education reform. Only through societal change will women be able to reach their full potential. To finish today, Deputy President Officer, I'd like again to express my support for this pilot and for all efforts in eradicating gender-based violence in the workplace. No woman or man should be subject to this kind of behaviour, and it's vital we stand shoulder to shoulder in condemning it. I hope through societal discussion and initiatives that embedded good ethos in our workplaces and that there's real progress made. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Finney. Ms Bailey, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank Gail Ross for bringing such an important issue to the Chamber and for the content of her speech. And of course, to close the gap for providing such a useful briefing. This is not the first time I've stood up in this chamber and spoken about why gender inequality has no place in any aspect of our society and violence against women and girls simply cannot go on any longer. As the Minister with Responsibility for Equalities and Tackling Domestic Abuse in the very first Parliament, many of these issues are not new. Progress has been made across governments of different political hues, but there is still much to be done. And I wholeheartedly support the work that's being carried out by Close the Gap in their fight to eradicate gender-based inequalities from our workplace. Their work is integral to understanding the embedded societal reasons for why women are all too often coming second to men in the workplace. But more importantly, they understand how in-depth legislative changes and a revaluation of the labour market as a whole must occur if we hope to even make a step in the right direction towards ending workplace gender discrimination. This fight is clearly far bigger than just trying to change the stubborn attitudes of a select few. The Equally Safe at Work strategy is a pioneering programme in incorporating the role and duty of care of the employer as a way to preventing and ending domestic violence. I am encouraged to learn, as others have already referenced, seven Scottish local authorities piloting the strategy this year, and I know far more have expressed an interest, including the councils in my area of Western Bartonshire and Argyll and Butte. In fact, as Gail Ross said earlier, every local authority responded to the request for an expression of interest. And there is a shadow group of early adopters for when the programme is rolled out after the pilot, and that is encouraging. But it is the case that women who are suffering from domestic abuse often don't know where to turn to for support. They don't know who they can trust, and all too often they don't know who will believe them. The workplace should and must be a safe haven for women who are being abused. And employers must be properly trained and equipped to support their employees who do come to them seeking support and advice. But we do need to ask ourselves wider questions. How can a woman feel confident that their employer will support them when they see how embedded gender discrimination still is in workplaces across the country? How can women hope to feel financially independent enough to leave an abusive relationship when the gender pay gap is all too rife in our society? When 52% of women in the UK have admitted to experiencing sexual harassment at work, the importance of the work carried out by the Equally Safe at Work strategy cannot be underestimated. For decades, women have been pigeonholed into gender-appropriate jobs whilst keeping quiet and shrugging off sexual harassment for fear of being further discriminated against. Through evidence-based advice and guidance, employers will, for the first time, be adequately equipped to support their female employees who are suffering from abuse, harassment and discrimination. I think this is a significant breakthrough in how we deal with gender inequality and sexual harassment in a professional setting, and I hope this will spread throughout every aspect of society. In closing, presiding officer, can I take a moment to appeal to my colleagues, both here in the chamber and those unable to join us this evening, to follow that groundbreaking work of Close the Gap. The Scottish Parliament is a large workplace, and each and every one of us are employers to a number of staff 
both in this building and indeed across Scotland. We have a duty of care to protect our employees and it should be a priority not to discriminate against them based on their gender. Our staff have the right to come to work without fear of sexual harassment. And in the unfortunate cases where our staff may be victims of domestic abuse, it is vital that as employers, there is support in place for them so that they can be made to feel safe and protected. I hope, presiding officer, we will lead by example to ensure that workers across Scotland are truly equally safe. Thank you very much. I call John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Finney, please. Okay, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Can I start by congratulating Gail Ross on bringing this very important issue here uh, and welcome the launch um, of the Equally Safe at Work um, strategy and commend the work of uh, Close the Gap. Uh, I should declare I'm a co-convener with, uh, uh, with my colleague Rona Mackay and, and others of the cross-party group of men's violence against women and girls. And there's undoubtedly the case that we face significant challenges. The Equally Safe, uh, that Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate all forms of violence against women and girls is hugely important. And um, that strategy, and it does require that cohesion um, is to address gender-based violence. And that, that requires to be addressed very robustly. So I, I welcome Close the Gap and their participation in the, the labour market. I, I think it's going to be a very valuable contribution. Um, and I, I noted from uh, that they work with policymakers, and that would include people in here, employers and employees, to influence and enable actions to address the causes of women's inequality at work. And, um, my colleague Gail Ross outlined a number of, of, of the, these issues. I, I won't repeat them. Um, others have talked about the leadership role that this uh, building and its members should be playing, and I think that is pivotal. This is a cross-party issue. There shouldn't be any divergence on that. Uh, and I think there's an important role for men to call out the, 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 the great challenges that remain on... on uh, I commend the work of the White, White Ribbon, and on Friday I'm joining with other... Uh, male politicians uh, to promote their initiative of working within betting shops um, to uh, make it very clear that uh, um, violence against women uh, is unacceptable. I think partnership working is the key there. Um, I was delighted to hear of COSLA's involvement and indeed the response from Scotland local authorities and, and like Jackie Bailey pleased that uh, um, to, you know, to note that Highland and uh, Shetland are involved from um, my particular area. 70% um, of women in Scotland have reported experiencing or witnessed sexual harassment in the workplace. That's a damning, a damning indictment. That's someone's mother, grandmother, daughter, niece. Um, they, these are our fellow citizens. And there are obligations placed on employers to ensure that uh, work is, is a place of safety. It's, a, as, as Jackie Bill said, a duty of care. It's also a role for trade unions and staff associations that, that play in that. There's a role for workers, customers, bystanders. There's a role for all of us. Uh, and um, there's a key word in the motion that I was drawn to, and that's the word challenge. And it's not always going to be the case that that's going to be a direct intervention. I know that there'll be concerns on some that that will escalate problems, but it is to share, to act, and to never ignore. Uh, with one in five experience in domestic abuse at some point in their life, um, that's, a, 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 I say, a, a statistic that shames not just the perpetrators, but all of us. And we know how pernicious and far-reaching it is. The Domestic Abuse Bill uh, um, is uh, a, a piece of legislation that examined the uh, co uh, coercive and controlling behaviour and the, the reach that that has. And the workplace is not beyond that reach. Indeed, the workplace is somewhere where people are known to be at and can often feel trapped. A, a hierarchy that's reflected in pay grading and access to... To, to training um, is something that's also been alluded to, uh, basically the patri patriarchy at work. So uh, I recognise, I'm not an optimist, I, uh, I'm not, I, I'm, let me start again, I am an optimist, I'm not pessimistic about this. I think there has been great progress made over the years, clearly, clearly, clearly there's a, a, there's a, a way to go and uh, the workplace is no different from anywhere else. Uh, um, to my mind, education is absolutely the key, so I, I wish close the gap well. I wish the participating authorities well. I know that there'll be continued interest from within this building. And once again, I congratulate my colleague Gail Ross on bringing this important issue to us. Thank you. Thank you. And we're very pleased to learn you're an optimist after all. Uh, call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr MacArthur, Thank please. you very much, Deputy President. Obviously, can I join others in uh, thanking and congratulating my, my good friend Gail Ross on bringing this debate uh, to Parliament. Uh, it, it is an important debate. The, uh, the Equally Safe uh, work, uh, work Initiative 
is one which, as I think John Finney suggested, is one that should and does command cross-party uh, support. And I could I also acknowledge uh, and thank Close the Gap for the contribution that they uh, have made and, um, and, and are going to make going forward. Obviously, this is part of the wider uh, equally safe uh, strategy. And, uh, and I think Gail Ross was right to remind us of the collaborative uh, approach that underlies that. It's, uh, it is the only way of ensuring uh, that that strategy enjoys the success we all wish it uh, to see. I think Annie Wells pointed to the debate we had previously in November on uh, violence against women and girls. That was a, a, an excellent uh, debate. Um, I think we were right at that stage to acknowledge the progress that's been made in a number of areas. I think at the time the Domestic Abuse Act um, was fresh in our minds. Um, I think the approach that uh, Police Scotland and uh, Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service are taking uh, again was uh, commended but at the same time I think acknowledged across the chamber was the fact that we've got some way to go uh, in terms of addressing uh, the, the, the concerns that sexual crimes uh, I think the latest figures uh, were uh, had shown a, a worrying uh, increase uh, and I think what was also accepted is while men and boys um, can and are affected by violence uh, just a cursory glance at the statistics demonstrates beyond any uh, contradiction at all uh, the gendered nature uh, of uh, violence now the, the the reasons for this are, um, are, are perhaps more complex than uh, i will be able to articulate in uh, four minutes but uh, i think gail ross was absolutely right in, in opening this debate to draw that link uh, between violence against women uh, and uh, inequality, inequality in society more generally, but uh, inequality specifically in the workplace. I was looking at um, some of the figures that exist suggesting the gender pay gap um, on average sees women in Scotland earn around £183 per week less uh, than men, and that over the course of um, their working life that can result in uh, anything up to uh, around half a million pounds of, of disparity and that is a colossal um, uh, divergence in terms of the, uh, the, the, the financial independence of women as compared uh, to, uh, to men. Um, I, I think the, the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission reports also estimated that 54% of women a year lose their jobs as a result of becoming pregnant or going on maternity leave. A shocking statistic. Um, uh, likewise, I think the statistics that both Jackie, Jackie Bailey and John Finney referred to in terms of the levels of sexual harassment at work. I mean, it just seems to beg a belief that, that any business that fails to treat its employees equally and fairly, that takes an absolute zero um, uh, tolerance approach to harassment in, in, in any form in the workplace, is a business that will uh, attract the, the, the best and the brightest that, 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 that has um, any hope of, of, of realising its own potential uh, as, a, as an organisation. And, and, and therefore, I think there are, that there are probably very many um, uh, self-serving reasons why uh, businesses need to take this uh, more seriously. I'm delighted to see that a number of the local authorities uh, are, are, have taken up uh, this initiative, that the, the response across the board has been so positive. Uh, hopefully, through debates like this and our continued interest in this in, uh, issue, we can encourage others uh, to, to do so. But for the time being, again, can I uh, wish Close the Gap well and thank Gail Ross again for uh, allowing this Parliament to have this debate this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Bill Kidd, who followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr Kidd, please. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thank you also to Gail Ross and Close the Gap for bringing this important topic forward for us to debate in chamber here. It must be said that employers have every reason to take on the task of tackling violence against women. For a victim of domestic abuse, their place of work may be one of the only spaces, sadly, the only space where they can seek help, as normally, normally, the perpetrator is not there. Establishing safe mechanisms for these individuals to approach a trustworthy colleague could make all the difference. Local authorities which employ 245,000 people in Scotland are a good example of a group of employing organisations well placed to champion this change. And it's my hope that there will be a shift in perceptions encouraging victims of domestic abuse to seek help and making safeguarding of women a norm in HR policies. In my contribution to this debate, I want to make two things very clear. Firstly, abuse is never acceptable. 
We inherently deserve to be treated with dignity, respect and love. If anyone listening to this thinks this does not apply to them, then they need to hear that they are wrong. There is nothing in this world that strips this birthright away from you. If you are in an abusive relationship or situation, then you're not being treated the right way. You deserve to be treated with dignity, respect and love, and no one is an exception to this rule. Secondly, help is available for women. Scottish Women's Aid are a good first point of call if you are a victim of domestic abuse, and men who are victims of domestic abuse can go to Survivors UK or the Men's Advice Line for help. These organisations can help you to safely leave a partner, providing support all along the way. There is a clear moral imperative for employers to provide support for victims of domestic abuse and ensuring that the pay gap is closed. Through equal pay, women can become financially independent, it's been said earlier, more than once, and the control exerted by an abusive partner is lessened. This task is relevant to employers because in all likelihood, there will be people in your workforce who are victims of domestic abuse. Moreover, any employee experiencing domestic violence will be affected whilst at their work. In the UK as a whole, violence against women is estimated to cost £1.9 billion to the economy. Significantly and specifically, this is due to increased product, deep, big pardon, decreased productivity, administration difficulties due to unplanned time off work, lost wages and sick pay. Three quarters of women who are experiencing domestic abuse will, whilst at work, be harassed, threatened or abused by their current or former partner. This, of course, has an impact on the victim's ability to work as normal, particularly as work phones and emails are often the way in which the perpetrator continues to make contact. One in five women in Scotland experience domestic abuse in their lifetime, directly affecting 553,300 women in Scotland. This means that for every five women working in a company, statistically speaking, one of these employees will have experienced domestic abuse. This is a devastating statistic. We owe it to these women to take our collective responsibilities in tackling domestic violence seriously. Local authorities will make a significant impact by championing the Equally Safe at Work accreditation programme. I urge all employers listening to this debate to seriously consider what steps you can take to tackle domestic violence amongst your workforce. For every woman moved into safety, these steps are unequivocally worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Gillian Martin. And Ms Martin will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to thank Gail Ross for bringing this debate to the Chamber today and close the gap for their briefing. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak on this very important issue of equality in the workplace. And no matter what age, race, background or gender, everyone should feel safe or comfortable in their workplace. Everyone has a job to do and no one should ever be held back from achieving or striving to do the very best they can. Even though attitudes are improving and awareness around harassment in the workplace is increasing, sadly behaviour and attitudes derived from gender equality perpetuate. The figures around sexual harassment in the workplace make for grim reading, with almost three quarters of women in Scotland witnessing or experiencing sexual harassment at work. There is so much more that has to be done to, to tackle this scourge in our society. Presiding officer, when I learned of the Equally Safe at Work programme through Gail Ross's motion, I decided it was such an important endeavour that I wanted to support it. The programme aims to eradicate violence against women and girls, and it is the only one of its kind. As Jackie Bailey said, it is pioneering. Although Equally Safe at Work is not currently being rolled out as a pilot in my area of the Scottish borders, I want to wish all those involved in the other pilots across the parts of Scotland and hope it creates a long-term lasting impact on workplaces. And I hope it builds a foundation for change to embed a strong culture of gender equality within those organisations and those organisations that take it up in the future. I hope it proves to be effective so that we can see it across Scotland and not just at local government, um, with go local government employers, but also in other sectors. There is no doubt of the negative impact of domestic abuse in the workplace. 
The programme aims to highlight the effects that domestic abuse have, has on productivity in the workplace. And many of us take for granted just turning up for work to face the day, getting on with tasks, meeting paperwork and email. Well, however, for domestic abuse victims, the days are long and productivity is lost. And this is often a hidden issue that must be addressed. Closer to home in the borders, I'm really proud of some excellent work that's going on to help with this, namely the CEDA project and Victim Support Scottish Borders. We do want more women who are victims of domestic abuse to come forward, and we have seen evidence of this with the increase in the number of reported incidences. However, we can't be soft on those abusers. I hope that um, with the support of these organisations, women can be helped back into the workplace and assistance will be given to them uh, in, in time of their need. In closing, presiding officer, the Equally Safe at Work programme aims to be a successful step forward in tackling workplace harassment and violence against women. And I really look forward to seeing the positive change the programme will bring. And I hope that Close the Gap will explore the larger rollout and perhaps the Scottish Borders will join in uh, as a pilot too. We have come a long way but there is even further to go. If we are to have a true equality in the workplace, let's just keep up the momentum. And I thank Gail Ross once again, and I thank Close the Gap for their involvement in this very important project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Call Gillian Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. Ridding society of gender-based violence, sexual harassment and sexual discrimination starts with advancing gender equality. A specific accreditation, accreditation scheme to tackle gender equality is long overdue. And I want to thank Gail Ross for bringing the debate to the Chamber and for eloquently drawing the link between workplace discrimination and economic insecurity as a cause, cause behind or an exacerbator of gender-based violence. And I'm glad that Close the Gap are the leaders in this initiative for that reason. And I want to look at some of that inequality. Um, we're just at the pilot stage of the Equally Safe at Work, but I'm really hoping that beyond that point, the scheme can be rolled out to the private sector for them to take up on a voluntary basis, where it's been my experience that the greatest change has to happen. The precarious work that can leave a woman unable to leave a violent partner because of economic insecurity largely exists in the private sector. Uh, that inequality is apparent in the gender pay gap. That pay gap is a symptom of a workplace culture born out of stubborn gender stereotypes and systematic inequality. Career progression should not be dependent on whether a woman has caring responsibilities. I've heard plenty of women been asked by employers if they're planning to start a family, but never men. I've told the story before of telling a former boss that I was expecting my first child. His knee-jerk reaction was to say this, I thought you were interested in your career. Every time I tell this story, I have other women telling me similar stories or worse, women being quietly dropped from management training programmes, uh, projects being given to someone else, opportunities melting away like snow off a dike, never blatantly, of course. After asking for a pay rise many years ago, the same boss likened me to his wife, who, who told me, and I quote, also liked a bit of extra pin money. I was a producer in a corporate video production. I wasn't asking my man for money for a coat I'd seen in the cooperative like a 1950s housewife. The boss probably meant no harm by those comments, but I felt angry and humiliated. And those comments are reflective of a wider culture that diminishes female employees' status. Now, both those instances are over 20 years ago, but I've seen plenty of women sidelined since. Discrimination and offence in the workplace in regard to pregnant workers and mothers is just one part of a suite of harassment and discrimination. And this problem is the problem that's particularly acute in the private sector. Constructive dismissal of pregnant women is rife. I once witnessed a colleague of mine have our duties and responsibilities reshaped and reassigned to other people as part of a so-called restructure after a company takeover, and she resigned due to the upset and stress, leaving her with no maternity benefits. It was it is estimated that 54,000 women lose their job as a result of becoming pregnant, but the full picture may be masked by the widespread abuse in the private sector of non-disclosure agreements. Additionally, Zero hours contracts allow employers to simply reject any worker regardless of circumstances. And as we know that women are more likely to have a zero hours situation. In those cases, if you fall pregnant, you could often fall off the rota. 
But losing your job is perhaps the extreme of discrimination, but being pregnant at work can often lead to comments that the perpetrator thinks are innocent, even friendly, but they diminish, disrespect and embarrass the woman on the receiving end. Inappropriate comments about whether or not you'll be coming back to work, or what arrangements you'll be making on your return to work, or assumptions that you'll not be able to continue at the level at which you're currently at, or do as much work, are bandied about pretty much every day. No one ever comments on these things when you're an expectant father. All those things might sound harmless, but they're not. They contribute to a view that mothers are not good promotion prospects and are of less value than their male counterparts. And gender have stated that, despite political leadership on women's equality at the Scotland level, there is a widespread and systematic failure to grasp the challenge of mainstreaming across public authorities. Women's equality within the public sector has largely stalled as a result. Well, presiding officer, in closing, the public sector is just the start. The private sector must be fully involved too if we're to make universal systematic change and I hope that we get to that point soon. Thank you. Thank you very much and I call on Christina McCarvey to close for the Government Minister, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I thank Gail Ross for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber on the day that we launched the pilot and thank all of the colleagues across the Chamber for their very important contributions. I'm going to touch on, I think, I think uh, on what everybody had to say today. Uh, President Officer, the No Violence Against Women and Girls cannot and must not be allowed. We've already said that. This violence pervades every aspect of a woman's life and the workplace is no exception. We've heard very clear examples of that. This violence, as we know, comes at huge costs. It inhibits women and girls from realising their true potential, requires the diversion of resources for crisis and immediate intervention, and has a toxic impact on our wider society. And John fin fi Finney rightly commended the work of White Ribbon whilst reminding us that men have a key role to play here and none of us should be bystanders. The government, this parliament and society as a whole have a responsibility to take action to end violence against women and girls. To achieve success, we must work together and leave no one behind. Rona Mackay and John Finney talked about the cross-party group, a perfect example of politicians across parties working with stakeholders to advance and progress uh, the policies of this place and ending that inequality. And Jackie and Bailey reminded us very clearly that this progress has been over the 20 years of this parliament and we should all be proud that we've worked together to achieve that. Our equally safe strategy has been described, and I quote, as the best violence against women strategy in Europe. It has a decisive focus on prevention, seeks to strengthen national and local collaborative working to ensure effective interventions for victims and those at risk, and contains a clear ambition to strengthen the justice response to victims and perpetrators. Our strategy prioritises primary prevention and we have already made progress to taking forward many of the actions in our associated delivery plan, particularly in our approach and to ensuring that our children have an understanding of important issues like consent and healthy relationships. And like Rachel Hamilton, I too hope that what has been launched today builds that foundation for change. We're already on that road and I have no doubt that it will. So I share those same ambitions as Rachel Hamilton. However, Although raising awareness and embedding understanding of gender-based violence across our schools, institutions and indeed wider society is undoubtedly hugely important, perhaps the bigger challenge is delivering a societal shift where women no longer occupy a subordinate position to men. And Gail Ross and Liam MacArthur spoke in their contribution about the gendered nature of violence against women and girls and how this is borne out by the statistics that we have already heard. That is why... The work to close the gap our undertaking is so important and will pay, play a vital part in our goal of advancing women's equality in the workplace. Jackie Bailey also said in her, her um, contribution that the workplace should be a safe haven for women who are being abused. It should also be a place where you feel supported and understood. And as John Finney said, that trust and relationship where you can actually get some support with the situation that you're faced with in your life. Now, our, our government and this parliament has a strong track record in this area. We've got a gender balanced uh, cabinet. The establishment of the Advisory Council on Women and Girls, which I believe met this morning, was incredibly lively. And that the introduction of the legislation to lock in the gains of ensuring equality representation on public Public boards are just a few of the important steps we have taken. However, we've all recognised in the Chamber today, every single speaker, that there is still much to, to, to be done to ensure that women are properly represented in our political and public institutions and more widely in senior and decision-making positions. Of course, we know that in terms of equal representation, we're not even there yet. And the imperative 
of the private sector to adopt this accreditation was passionately articulated by Gillian Martin, but we've got some work to do here as well as the work with the private sector, because just over 36% of members of this place and 32% of MPs at Westminster are women. At the current pace of change, it will take another 25 years before we reach 50-50 women and local government. We have work to do. The fact that we still have a gender pay gap is also unacceptable. Women in our society also continue to be underrepresented in boardrooms, senior management roles, and are co and concentrated in low paid and undervalued positions, as articulated by many speakers today. Annie Wells made clear links to the economic impact of equal pay, and she's absolutely right to do that. And Gillian Martin told us about how inappropriate comments and the loss of opportunity have a huge impact on women's ability to advance in the workplace. This lack of representation is precisely why women are often disproportionately affected by benefit cuts. They unjustly bear the brunt of austerity and can become cemented in a lifetime of low earnings and underutilised qualifications. And if you're in an abusive relationship, that's another way that you're cemented into that. Um, if women are not in the room when that policy is being made, it means we get further entrenched inequality. And Gail Ross reminded us that women are twice as likely to be dependent on social security. So a piece of work to be done there. This economic inequality serves to reinforce gender inequality across society, as often a lack of financial independence can limit women's freedom and restrict their choices. That's why I support, and I believe many in this place support changes to the universal credit system, to enable split payments to households to maintain financial independence for women who are in domestic abuse or coercive controlling situations. It is also important to stress at this juncture the wider impact of violence has and can be felt across our society. Violence against women costs the economy an estimated £40 billion each year. So it makes good business sense that employers realise the part that they have to play in not only designing policies that help overcome the barriers women face at work, but the key role that they also have to play in supporting women who experience gender-based violence, either within the workplace or in their home on homes. The use of workplace resources that we've heard today to continue abuse, to continue stalking, create an atmosphere of, of, of fear discussed by Rona Mackay and Bill Kidd is an area where employers can take clear action and make progress on immediately. That is why we are proud to support Close the Gaps pioneering Equally Safe at Work accreditation programme, which we believe will be, have the potential to create a real step change for women working in local government. I know they're in the public gallery and when I met Ruth and Kelsey today, they were absolutely full of uh, enthusiasm and really uh, looking forward to the, the pilots concluding and rolling out the work that they are doing. Those local authority areas who are taking part in the pilot have the opportunity to lead the way in tackling gender inequality across local government, insti instituting appropriate measures to support and ensure the safety of employees who are experiencing gender-based violence and creating genuinely inclusive work cultures that play a crucial role in preventing such violence. I have already heard from Councillor Mary Donnelly at South Lanarkshire Council. She and her team and a cross-party group of councillors were very keen to do this, uh, this work and she's had a, ded a life dedicated to, to um, a women's equality. But I would therefore take this opportunity to wish to close the gap every success as it takes forward this project into the next phase. And I look forward to watching how the pilot develops over the coming months. Bill, say, Bill Kidd said to us in this debate that this is a moral imperative for employers. He's absolutely right. Achieving gender equality and ending violence against women and girls once and for all is a shared responsibility of all of us. I hope we continue to work together to build on the success we have already enjoyed to create a Scotland where everyone feels equally safe. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.